on the brought to you by the Orthopedic Research and Education Foundation India through Author TV. Today we have uh, Professor Raj Gopalan from Pondicherry. Uh, Raj Gopalan was an old colleague of mine in Jipma many, many, many years ago, and uh, we've been friends uh, through all these many years with without seeing too much of each other. But it's always a pleasure mm -hmm. to catch up with him and. Uh, He'll be talking to us about the clinical examination of the lumbar spine. So over to you, Raj Gopal. Thank you, John. Thank you for the kind words. Um, good evening to all the postgraduates and others who have joined us in this today's venture. Now, I know that most of you will be aware of everything what I'm going to talk. At least most of the things I talk. I just want it to be a, something like a refresher for those who know. And about the first year residents who have joined in, and I hope this talk will be useful for them in knowing the protocol. The most important thing is to follow the protocol so that we all do the same way, we all talk the same language and we don't miss anything, not just in the exam. This is not meant for the exam. Exam is one step in our career, then after that, you don't want to miss anything. None of us do uh, want anything like that. So, yeah, I'm going to the basics. You can go wrong in tough things. You can be pardoned, but you can't go wrong in basics. So, I'll be stressing the basics. No, you may be knowing this. Please put up with it. With that, um, uh, let me come to the first slide. Now, spine is no different from a hip or anything. By everything, you have to have a systematic approach. But the difference is that here you are combining along with spine and neurology. And if you miss something in neurology, your diagnosis or management is going to change. So what is most important is to have a systematic approach. Whether it be history or our examination findings or the neurology, you combine the neurology and the findings to come to an interpretation and your diagnosis. Then you come to correct diagnosis. You miss any of them. If you miss the history also, it can make a difference. A spinal claudication, you are to make out from history. Similarly, every field is important. So the, my first request to all of you, the residents, is that learn to examine. You can't do it in the OPD, but when you have a patient in the ward, please take time, take a book with you, whatever with you, 10 patients you examine systematically, then you will not need anybody or anything else to guide you. Automatically, you will know what to read. But what the mind does not know, the eyes will not see. You have to have a basic knowledge of anatomy. This is not the time to cover it. But I just only want to stress you that if you do not know that, if you don't know the dermatomes, then if you don't know the sensory coverage of the area, then it is a different ball game altogether. The steps of examination is almost similar. It is going to be a good history. Then after that, clinical examination. And examination should start with gait here also. The gait is equally important. A general examination is much more important in the spine. than inspection, palpation, movements, measurements, neurology, special tests, secular joints. And then something else, if it is left out, you have to sometimes go back to general examination. Why? Because here there's a funny thing. The spine, it could be a deformity, it could be an infection. Let's, for example, take a spinal tuberculosis. If you see, you can have a deformity there also. You can have a neurology, you can have a constitutional problem. And each one, each one separately you have to examine. So we'll go by that as we grow down. So when you take history, just one simple way, this can apply not only for spine. Let's take a hip. It may be, a, let's say, tuberculosis or hip joint with a fibrous angulosis. Your first part of the history is about the pathology tuberculosis. Second part about your hip. Third part about the complication. Whatever you have, let's say there is a uh, uh, joint uh, fuchsia, fibrous angulosis. In the spine, it is much more elaborate. Why? Because the tuberculosis spine, again, you think of the what are the points in the history you should ask for uh, diagnosis and then and differential diagnosis. It may be a metastatic lesion. Then accordingly that you have to ask for that area of spine, cervical, lumbar or dorsal and complications here, neurology. So three things. You have to cover history for these three things. I'm not going in more in detail. And 
general symptoms and local symptoms specific to the involvement. You can ask leading questions and negative history. After all, in the exam, you may get a tuberculosis spine, a disc prolapse, or as instability like listosis. Tumors very rarely, you know, very rarely you will have an exam. Pyogenic is so painful, nobody will keep. Trauma and deformities, trauma which is a heel fracture with a paraplegia or quadriplegia, or a scoliosis, this can be kept. So each one, what is the relevant negative history or to think and ask? I'm not going into details. But the problem is not that. Problem is you give a near perfect diagnosis. You will not even say, uh, uh, let me say, disprolapse, disprolapse of the lumbar spine, no. Disprolapse of L4, L5 with uh, um, uh, weakness of this. Everything will give a perfect diagnosis. But if I ask you, what is the findings which made you say that there's a problem? So what happens? I know that you already seen the MRI, you already know the history, you already prepared for it. So that that is the sad situation. So it is important that you don't come to a diagnosis, but at least you you think what is possible theological one. Is it is it a, a traumatic one? Is it a metabolic one? Is it a chronic inflammatory one? Is it is a uh, infective one. That's what we mean by by the history. So how do you take the what are the things you ask in the history? I will not again tell each one, but the location of pain, onset of pain, mechanism of injury, diurnal variation, which is very important in many conditions, be it a inflammatory lesion, a lesion like to a rheumatoid or an infectious lesion like tuberculosis or ankylosis spondylitis, prior history of same symptoms, aggravating factors, relieving factors, activities of daily living, all are important. I am not going to go into that, but it's a small tips. Location of pain is not easy in a spine. For example, if you have a acromacalcular joint pain, patient can put the hand. It is very easy to locate because it is superficial. It is it is in the center of the area of coverage of C4. Whereas a backache, he will vaguely say, show you the lumbar area or thoracic area. Second thing, you are having a radiative pain. A radiating pain is indicating of a nerve root irritation, not necessarily a compression, compression or irritation. But you should know which nerve root it is. What is the biotope? What is the dermatome? If it's a peripheral nerve, femoral nerve, sciatic Now, what is the root value? These basic things you have to know. There is, I mean, if you don't know this, you are telling very big things. It probably doesn't make much impression. So once I, I don't go, that's all I'm going to cover about the history. When you examine the patient after a general examination, which again um, may come to it when necessary, but you start with the gait. Two reasons for starting with the gait. You don't know whether the patient can walk or not. You don't even know is allowed to be walked or not. You have a doubt from the history, ask the exam, examiner or the invigilator there. If patient is walking, forget about thing. Even you can see a tunnel lumbar gait. If there is a paralysis of the abductus, the hip is a tunnel lumbar gait. So it is not that you should look only for the spinal disorders. For example, even in a spinal cervical myelopathy, you have white base gait. And you have a paralysis of abductors by the by both sides. There will be a battling gait. Also, make use of this. Make the patient to walk on a tiptoe. If he is not able to walk, he shows a S1 lesion. If he has been walking in a heel, he can't do that L5 lesion. So at this stage, you know there is something wrong. When you go for the neurology later, this will help you. Other than this, classical test. Look for a, a tunnel lumbar gait and... It can be an gate, it can be a short limb gate, a foot drop gate. You can have a foot drop and a disc prolapse. You can have an gate in tuberculosis spine. Each each step will be painful to the patient. And short limb may be associated with some other costs. So the, the gait, other than this, for example, in tuberculosis, it is of equally diagnostic value. The, main, the way the patient is walking, the spine will be rigid. If it is a dorsal spine, if it's a lumbar spine, it's rather normal lumbar lordosis, you're going to have a straight spine. In a cervical spine, the child will come holding the neck like this. She won't allow you to touch, she won't allow you to move. And she will see that the head is supported by the hand. Similarly, in every, I'm, again, I'm not going to tell about each spine. So again, again, gait, gait is important. Then you come to inspection. You examine the patient in standing position if allowed. Sitting position if it's allowed, and then supine and prone. What do you want to see? How does it help you? 
you make the patient stand. So see from the back, you can see a coliotic deformity. You see from the side, you can see either exogenous lordosis or a absent lordosis. Or both the way it can be increased. It can be even go into kyphosis. But what is important is that you can have a scoliotic list when patient is shift away from the neural pain. What is commonly missed is a very simple thing. We ask you, how do you look for a paraspinal spasm? Very few people are able to tell because these are not taught. These are to be done. You can see by inspection the paraspinal muscles will be standing out. Then the median furrow between the two paraspinal muscles, that will be deeper. That will be as if it is exaggerated. The normal lumbar lordosis will be absent. And when you palpate, you put your hand on the muscle, it will be tender. For example, cervical spondylosis, you put on, squeeze the trapezius, it will be painful, indicating a spasm. These are the basic things which you shouldn't miss. It can be diagnostic in some case. You see this, uh, one of the common, um, not so uncommon uh, syndrome is a crippled field syndrome. You see from the back, you see a low leg line, uh, low leg uh, uh, hairline, and you don't see the neck at all, the very short neck. And you have to think in terms of a uh, crippled field syndrome. And you do an X-ray, all the suboxial spines are fused. And you can see there is also a undescended scapula or spinal shoulder. So just examination from the alone, inspection alone gives you a diagnosis. Then you know there's a normal cervical lordosis, normal dorsal kyphosis, normal lumbar lordosis. These curves can be accentuated. They can be all increased. They can be lost. One of the best ways, make the patient stand against a wall. In at least, you don't need it every time till you know what is the normal curvature like this. See what are the points in contact with the wall. You have to put an anglosin pontylitis patient, his head will be standing, occipital will not touch the wall at all because of the increased uh, dorsal spine kyphosis. And uh, this is a normal alignment. Of course, I want to just put it to one. So when you see from the side, you are seeing a kyphosis. If you see this X-ray, um, you can see there is a rounded kyphosis. Commonly, today you can see, if you are in an OPD in a general hospital or a government hospital, you will find the severe osteoporosis with the patient coming almost 90 degree angulation of the spine, uh, rib completely in kyphotic. It can be seen in a serial kyphosis. Adolescent one, you have adolescent Schuerman disease, sometimes in anglosis pondylitis. So these are the things which are easily made out on inspection and give us a tuberculous kyphotic deformity can be involving a single vertebra. It can occur in a fracture, sometimes in general anomaly, and that will be a knuckle deformity. If it's involving two, there can be angular deformity, as you can see in this MRI involving two spines. And when it's more than two or uh, three spines, it is an eye. It's a rounded one, which we just now saw. This is a patient again with a involving a, a angular type of deformity. The opposite lumbar spine, you have a the I forgot to put it off. Um, the lumbar spine, you have a normal lumbar lordosis, which can be exaggerated producing a flat lumbar spine, it can even go into kyphosis depending upon the cause. And you should know, if you have a thing, you should ask what are the causes. I have not put this to tell you, but if you, can you put this uh, thing off? So if there is, a, say, a reversal of the normal lumbar lordosis, what are the causes? Simple cause is a spasm, where the lumbar lordosis will be absent. But in ankylosis, pontylitis may go into opposite also. But just beware, that increased lumbar lordosis could be normal, especially in the women. So that also, a flexion deformity of the hip, as you know, you do that in your Thomas test in the hip, there is a secondary increased uh, uh, lumbar lordosis. So it's not necessarily only for the spinal lesion. Scoliosis, I'm not going to go into that, it's a separate chapter, but when you see a scoliosis, same time, Inspection, you don't have to touch the patient, ask the patient to bend. Adam's forward bending test, what you use in a um, scoliosis um, detection in a school, uh, student, college, school uh, children. If on forward flexion, the scoliosis disappears, it is a postural one or not a rigid one. 
And if the coleosis persists and you have a rib hum, then it's a structural coleosis. Along with that, you should look for a shoulder tilt and pelvic tilt. See this man now, you have found that he has got a yeah, lean tilt on to the, uh, distort to the right side, distance between the arm and the uh, abdominal wall is decreased here compared to here, abnormal skin folds. And this is what you see classically in a disc. There are some telltale evidences seen in the clinical examination, particularly if you have a child with a CTEV, you have club, uh, congenital epithelioma you are supposed to look for to the spina bifida occulta. I will come to that later. Along with that, look for any surgical scar, look for any other swelling. The commonest swelling that you should think of in a tuberculous patient is a cold abscess. Then the abdominal crisis just now showed to you and look for wasting of the gluteal muscles, hamstring muscles, and calf muscles. The skin lesions, skin uh, pigmentations, other than what we talk about in terms of uh, occulta, the commonest and most important is a coffee spot. In orthopedics, coffee spot is important in polyarthritic fibroid dysplasia and neurofibroid process. Coming to spine, it did the neurofibromatosis, which is associated with scoliosis. So once you, this was a um, young boy about 25 to 35 years, I think, way back, about more than 20, 30 years, I saw in, more than 20 years back, I saw in St. John's with a big lesion, and he had a scoliotic curve, which was rigid by the time. Coming to spina bifida occulta, there are four telltale uh, things you see in inspection. One can be a tuft of hair, or it can be a skin pigmentation, like just now I saw neurofibroma, or a skin discoloration. You may find a swelling which may look like a lipomatous swelling, or you may just puckering of the skin or dimple. That's a hairy patch. It's a book for the book only. And that's a lipomatous swelling. And this is a child with a dimple. And if you, for example, you see a equinovas deformity of the foot, this is not a club foot, but this was a child. You can see the MRI, the spinal cord comes up to there, and you can see the CSF also coming. It was not uh, going up to the skin level. It was not just a swelling uh, occulta. It was a manifesto. And another one, you, can, you should look for associated anomalies in the cord. So you, these are all paralytic equinoviral deformity. They are not a congenital equinoviral deformity. Quite often these are missed because a spina bifida occulta can be missed and a child about one year coming with a deformity is a paralytic one if these are there. And you can see there's one here. There's a tethered cord syndrome, which with growth, with the growth of the child, there will be increase in deformity. Or it is not that spina bifida is occurring only in the lumbar spine, very not very unusual, but not very common too. It can occur in the cervical area. I just want you to show this diastomatomalia and also a tethering there. So these cases, just not that you just see a spina bifida and that's the end of it. it can be a spina bifida manifesta, where you can see there's again a very small diastomatomalia there. And you can see there's a big spina bifida with a fluid there. Yes, yes, sir. Now, not all discolorations are clinically important. This is what is called a blue spot. It's also called a Mongolian blue spot, common in nations. This is totally harmless. It is of no clinical significance. So not all are going to be important. Lastly, among what you will see, there's a big swelling there. In our days, when we were students, tuberculosis is so common. This was a common thing. We used to probably see even 10 a day. But I don't know how many of you will see it now, not so common as before. A tuberculous cold abscess is something we should not miss in the exam. Why? Because it can be, if you have it, depends on whether the cervical spine is involved or the spine is involved. In cervical spine, the pus will collect anteriorly, it forms a retropharyngeal abscess. You can uh, it can present with a very dysphagia or a hoarseness of voice, etc. But in a lateral view, you can see here the widened retropharyngeal space. That's not the one. In thoracic spine, it may just remain in the paravertebral area as a paraspinal abscess, or it can track along the 
uh, various openings in the diaphragm. It may go along the big vessels. It can come into the, follow the vessels. It can present up to the medial part of the ankle or gluteal region or the thigh. So this, or from the mediastinal area along the intercostal nerve, depending on the branch, the first branch given by the costal nerve is just next to the midline posteriorly, then in the mid axillary area, and just close to the midpoint in the anteriorly. So it can walk, track along the intercostal nerve. So cold abscess can present anywhere. Then this is not for you to do this thing. Why I put all of you will know this. There's a reason I'll tell you later. Now you have to Palpate the spinous process and go along with it. You have to know which which spinous process it is. I only want to tell you about this area. That is your paravertebral muscles. We'll come to this a little bit later. Now, the reason I'm putting the anatomy here is that this is the iliac crust. A line joining these two is between L4 and L5. So you don't have to go from C7 counting the vertebra. You lose your time in the exam. This is quite reliable. X-ray is more reliable, but even clinically, follow the top of the iliac crust, keep a scale or a tape there, and the vertebra spinous process above, below. And this is the posterior superior leg spine. This is going to be important for you. This corresponds to S2. So when you want S1, if you want to put a goniometer, this S1 is where you are going to use. This PSIS is important because in a showburst test, you are going to draw a line joining these two, take a midpoint, 10 centimeters above, five centimeters below, that will come later, but you should know the anatomy. Now, examine posteriorly. As I just now told, palpate the iliac crust, draw a line, look for this too, palpate the finest process. You should know how to look for tenderness. Again, a basic, a direct pressure or a rotatory strain. These are two methods. Both are negative. You can use a light uh, or a gentle percussion for a deeper lesions. Um, I think all of this I have covered. And uh, run your finger down from the lumbar spine L1 in L4, L5 or L5 S1, you find a step that is called a step of deformity indicating listosis. Now, range of motion. This is very important. Now, you normally we do active and passive range of movements in any joint. We should always do active first because then you know how painful for the patient. Same thing in the spine. Spine, we usually don't do passive. It can be done. You don't have to do it. In FNB spine, sometimes we ask, not definitely for DNB, but you should know. Then third is there. Again, you don't even have to know about it. It's called resisted movements. I am not even going to talk about it. Active range of movements, how to do. I think we'll come to the picture itself now. That is going to be a lateral flexion. This is extension. This is deflection, touching the floor, and this rotation. Now, why I put this up? That here... Then normally, we don't use a goniometer to measure this in the OPD or for the exam. I don't expect you. But if I ask you, you should know how to use it. Both are different. Knowing is different. You don't have to do both. This is equally reliable. So in the OPD thing, you want right in the case sheet, the amount of movement. For example, lateral flexion. What is the distance from the tip to the ground? Or it is at the knee level, mid thigh level, or mid leg level. Like that, you can say. Extension is eyeballing or other thing. Rotation, again, eyeballing or goniometer. Flexion, the distance. And normally, an adult should be able to touch the floor if the distance between the tip and the floor is one good way of measuring. But if the examiner is very particular, ask you how do you use a thing. Now, goniometers, first of all, please practice a goniometer, not for spine, any other joint. Spine is a little more difficult because... Suddenly, if I ask you in the exam, you will keep the goniometer and you will be driving the car. You will not know where to keep it. First thing you have to learn is that this is the fulcrum of the goniometer. There are two types where one will be fixed, the other will be movable. Now, most of them are coming with both movable. Whatever it is, doesn't matter. Keep one fixed to the other one. So, you should know where to place. The one which is going, not going to move is a stationary arm. One is going to move, it's called the movement arm. Now, suppose I'll just give two examples, lateral bending and rotation, which you normally will not do. So, first, you have to keep the fulcrum in S1. How do you know? A line joining uh, both the posterior superior leg spine is S2. The spinous process just above that is one. Keep that there. Then, always keep the stationary arm first. This is the stationary arm. Sorry, this is the stationary arm below. 
I don't know whether you can see the pointer. The medial, medial cleft, sacral, medial sacral crust. Keep the other one parallel here. This will not move. Patient was straight. Now she has done a lateral flexion. Move this uh, move, uh, movement up to align with C7, the most prominent cervical spine vertebra. And this angle you can read out. To today's uh, uh, goniometer is available to you. This will be up for 30 degrees. You can read it out from that. This is how you use a goniometer. This is a little more difficult. I don't want to go into that. It's not necessary. So you should be knowing how to do it. I personally, I don't think you should uh, do it every time. That's up to you. Now coming to the measurements of the movements. Usually we do only showbus test, but that is mainly for lumbar spine movement. It is not that you cannot measure the other movement. For example, the ankylosing portalis, sometimes we measure the whole spine also. There, you make the patient uh, stand straight, measure the distance from the most prominent vertebra to the same point here, a line joining both the uh, PSIS or the dimple of venous, that midpoint. Then ask her to bend maximum, measure the distance. See how much the spine moves. That is spinal flexion. Same thing here. Patient in non-neutral position. Extension, the distance will come down. That is the what comes down is the extension. So you can measure like that. This is in case somebody asks you. Otherwise, you should know only about the Schauber's test, which will come to you later. Now, passive range of movement. I am not going to... You don't have to do this. You don't have to know. But I just want to know that, just know that it is possible. You can do passive flexion also, but you may need more than one person to do it. Show bus test and chest expansion, you should not forget and you should know. Chest expansion in any case with a bilateral hip disease, any case with a spinal problem, do a chest expansion. I will have something known to you, I will not cover, but show bus test, I will go in detail. It is for assessing the amount of lumbar flexion, number one. Please remember that lumbar spine flexion can be compensated quite a lot by the patient. He can, she can, she will flex the hip and adjust. But it is for objective measurement that we are going to do because of a diagnostic value, in particular in ankylosis spondylitis. There are the two methods of doing it. Either if the dimple of venous is inspection, should you will be able to see or palpation, draw a line joining both. Take a uh, where it cuts the midpoint, make a point, and five centimeters below, ten centimeters above, fifty centimeters, you have a line. Then ask the patient to bend forward, forward. Before that, if the dimple of venous is not seen or not palpable, palpate the posterior superior spine. Both the right joining that from the midline again, ten and five, so fifteen centimeters. If the patient should be able to go when the patient uh, bends. As much as maximally, as much as possible, patient bends the spine should travel at least another five to six centimeters. Should come to 21. Anything more than that is fine. Less than that is not fine. If it is less than uh, six centimeters, it is reduced. So that's 21 centimeters in a normal patient. You can also do a finger, <clears throat> the Schauber's test, like you do finger brand. I think it is difficult because unlike there, you have only three points here. There are many spiral processes. So this is not as easy to detect the movement as a finger brand. So again, I usually don't teach this or practice this. Now coming to neurology, which is the most important thing. So you have to start with straight leg sync test because suppose you run short of time, you miss this, that will be more bad. The other one, you can go faster. So do the SLR, a straight leg racing test, then go to neurology, where you look for motor, sensory, sensory system, reflexes, and don't forget the rectal examination. You need not straight away do. You can ask the examiner if he permits you, even if the patient is a female, do it. If he says don't do it, don't have to do it. I will run fast here, because to save time, and not only that, when you do a neurology, the first thing I want to know, am I, if there is a deficit, am I handling upper motor neural lesion or Let me say that I do examine the tone first. I find a classical spastic. Then I can guess what are the other tests are going to be. But it's going to be an extensor because it's a very clear. If it is a totally flaccid one, it's a lower motor neural lesion. 
So I will know before I do the reflexes, before I do even the motor, I know that the tone that it is upper motor inhalation. That, that, yes, that's sir, not sir, difficult. Tone, excuse me, sir. Yes. So you yeah. asked me to remind after 30 yes. minutes. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, thing. So these things I show up. I will leave this again. Let's go to the. This is what I want you to know. Reflex how to grade. There are two methods. I'm giving only one method. Here, in this method, the advantage is that 2 is the normal, 2 plus is the normal, 0, no response, 5 is the clonus. The others are all given in the books. I am not going to say. I prefer this because you know, even you can, between the no response and normal, there are two more gradients. Uh, please, um, it is all given in the books. You can just follow whichever one you want. Babinski test is something which all of you know. Please remember, this is normal in a newborn baby. Disappears quite fast after birth. This is something which you should know. Even I will forget. For example, acromacular joint is C4. The bulge of the deltoid is C5. The medial part of the forearm is T1. The lateral part is C6. In between that, you have C78. Axilla is T3. Between axilla and elbow, you have T2. The back, similarly, you have to think. Anyone, even if you know one is fine. Example point of view, you should know both. So this, you put a chart in your... Your teaching room, classroom, or seminar room, keep looking at it every day, it will be this thing. So, that, and as you said, whatever the movement, you should know the root value. Reflexes, you should have the root value, ankle, everything. And similarly, sensation. Very simple to remember put your hand in your pocket where your hand is L2. Just above that is L1, just below that L3, the leg is L4, medial leg, lateral leg is L5. So you learn to remember like this rather than Magita. I'm not, the Asia Employment Scale is not a part of clinical examination, but you should know how to grade that. Now comes to our uh, yeah, testing for a, a nerve root impingement or nerve root irritation. I will I'll skip this slide. Uh, this also I'll skip the names. Okay, a straight leg raising test is a passive one. It is for looking for the nerve irritation due to disc prolapse or even some other cause. So how do you do it? It is a passive one. It is not the patient who lift the leg. You have to lift the leg, putting your hand not in the knee, probably in the heel, so that the knee becomes straight, lift it up. Till the patient experiences pain in the way the radiation of pain is having. If it gets pain in the circular joint, you are touching the circular joint only. And notice at what level you are getting. Above 70 to 80 degrees, it is normal. For any person, it may be 80 degrees, maybe easily, or 90 degrees. In a very athletic, genuine, maybe even 100 degrees. But in an old man like me, even 70 degrees will be painful. Now, once you get the pain, there are methods by which you test a root tension. Just pain by lifting the leg does not mean root pressure. You have to form a sciatic stretch test. There are many methods. You can talk for one hour on a yeah, straight leg raising test itself. But I'm just going to tell any method is fine with you. If you want to dorsiflex the foot, fine. You want to make the patient flex the neck or you flex the neck, fine. You want to do a bowstring sign, fine. Any method, Braggart's, Kernick's, all that is fine. So when the SLR limit is reached, you just dorsiflex the foot. It produces an acute increase in pain. A simple method. Let's not go to different methods. Any method is fine. So this is a good method. If you are not happy with it, second one I will advise is a bowstring sign. These are the two things that are quite reliable. And uh, so I will skip this. So please remember what are the other conditions. If you have pain, the moment you touch the leg, it is definitely not root tension. He has some other problem. If you get very early, before 30 degrees, look for a piriform syndrome or some other condition. Not usually after 30 degrees, usually before 70 degrees. And a circular joint problem also will give you pain within around about 60 degrees. So um, a pain more than 70 degrees, it can be due to hamstring test. So, Kernick's wooden and skis, you can read in the book. Bowstring sign, moment you get the pain, bend the knee. Put your hand in the midline in the popliteal area and press. That is where you are. That is the bow and the nerve is the string. So, that will produce excitation of pain. More I like that. That or uh, angle dorsiflexion is good. 
this I will going to skip it. Um, last thing is, all that I'm going to speak. Um, skip. Cross SLR is very important. That is, when you do the normal side, uh, when you say affected side, you're getting positive. That is a standard one. If you do the opposite side and you get a SLR, that is a cross SLR. This is very, very important because SLR is very sensitive. It will be always positive. In a, we'll come to sensitivity later. It always be positive in a good percentage, but it doesn't not specific. It can be due to so many causes. Cross SLR, you get positive in a less number, but diagnostic. So what is specificity? The specificity of SLR is only 32%. Sensitivity is 91%. But uh, cross SLR is 98% specific. So that means if you get a cross SLR positive, you can be sure that there's a nerve root compression. So I'm going to speak. And a malingering also I'm going to speak. There are vital signs. The last sciatic nerve or that L, the L2, L3 root or a femoral nerve, you don't do a leg raising. You will put the patient prone, flex the knee, hyperextend the hip, extend the hip. This is positive. It is a strain of a femoral nerve or L2, L3 root compression. Uh, the femoral nerve in heteroperitoneal hematoma, particularly hemophilic, they come with a femoral nerve palsy. And you can have a L1, L2 disc also, which is even yesterday I had a case with L1, L2 thing. So that is already told to you how to do the femoral nerve stress test. So once you have done this, you have taken a history, you have palpated, you have got your neurology. Now, what is it? What is the level? First important thing, level you have to know. Is it upper motor nerve, low motor neuron? What is the level? What is the motor sensory level, sensory level, motor level, sensory level, reflexes level? The highest level is the neurological one. The spinal level will be different because spinal cord ends at L1. So at the lumbar, that level, you have to add three, it also spine. That, that all you will know, I'm not going to that. So when you give the diagnosis, you start with, for example, if it is going to be a fracture spine with paraplegia. Imagine fracture, say L1 with paraplegia. So then your anatomy is a traumatic one with a healed fracture and pathology is a cord compression and the level. Then what is the cord level, what is the motor level and what is the vertebral level. And once you say that, after that all the questions asked to you, investigation, management, surgery will not make any harm for you. It will make your mask better. So this, all this talk, so much uh, things you may find is impossible to do within 45 minutes or time given in the exam. But as Nasrallah said, uh, Mandela said, nothing is impossible till it looks impossible only when you see. When you do it, it may not be impossible. So thank you for listening and all the best to all of you in the exam. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Rajgopal. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some questions, so we'll uh, open the floor for questioning, and then... So, uh, thank you very much, sir. While we are waiting for the questions, sir. So, uh, what you have uh, explained in during your talk is that the order is same, like other examination of uh, the parts of the body, like inspection, palpation, movement, measurement, and special test. Yeah. One, Yes, sir. Uh, can you uh, just stop sharing. Can you just can... repeat that? Neurological examination. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. I missed your. I mean, part of it I missed because I okay, was sir. closing the PowerPoint. So yes, just, sir. Just stop please. sharing. Yeah, stop sharing. Sir. You are able to hear me? Yeah. Can you just yes. stop sharing the screen? Then we can. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's a good idea. Sorry. I told you, no, it's a little bit. Uh... Yeah. 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 Now it's better. Great. Yeah. yeah. Now can you it's, tell me? So uh, the order of uh, spine examination is same as other joints, like uh, inspection, palpation, movement, measurement, special test, and then a neurological examination. Yeah. Now, see, I just desired something. One of the common questions asked to me was, sir, we have a spine and uh, neurology, should I start examining, presenting the neurology for spine? We are orthopedic surgeons, present the spine, the bone, number one. Inspection, the uh, palpation, as I told you, inspection, I told you about the various uh, deformities and body point palpation. There is, see here, movements and measurements are combined together in the spine. 
In fact, your movements, you are actually measuring them. If you take a Schomburg test, which is the commonest test done by all of us, it is actually a chest expansion. It's nothing but a movement of the costovertebral joints. So we are measuring the joints rather than uh, joint movements that, like for example, in a hip or a knee, where we talk in terms of degrees. Here we are using each step to measure. So movements and measurements are combined. They are not, because you have a whole neurology to do. So it cannot finish, even in a regular setup, you, you design, time will be a problem. So combine. And you don't have to do all the things. If you want, to, if you have done, for example, a spinal flexion, that's enough. You don't have to repeat anything at all with it. If patient is able to touch the ground, you don't have to do any um, uh, job test also because the movement is full. So similarly, a lateral flexion is relevant only in some patients in deformities. In a classical tuberculosis or spine, you just only, you, 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 you will not be able to test movement if it is painful. Otherwise, if it is not painless, you can do a flexion extension. The, you have to choose according to the case time. I'm talking to the students actually. And you, you don't have to do. You do one, for example, if you are doing a straight leg racing test, one test is enough. You don't have to do Kernick, Braggarts, everything. They're not necessary. Because you need time for neurology. And neurology, that's why I said, if you find a classical uh, capacity, you probably have to do only one reflex if time doesn't permit you. Because you may not get time to do all the uh, reflexes. Sensations, again, I didn't cover at all. We are doing for a sensory loss, filaments. It's not, we keep filaments sometimes for the NB exam. You won't get time. So you probably do a temperature and this thing, if it is kept there, you, any one which is positive, that's enough for you to give a diagnosis that there is a sensory lesion in this particular dermatome. So spine, you'll have to cut short the things. Otherwise, because neurology takes time. And parietal examination takes a lot of time. You just can't do it and come out. So one more thing, sir. What about parietal examination? Yes. The correct the... examination is very important because let's say even leaving the exam time, the spinal shock has passed off or not. Number two, you have to put your level and it depends. In my time or even now, motor centers, if the female patients are there for DNB, I'll say no need to do a parental test. But in FNB, we have to do. So the, it, you should be prepared for that. You should be prepared for that. You ask the examiner. If it's a male patient, he may ask you. But as to most of the time when I tell that today things are different because you don't get that much privacy, it is a problem for me, not only for them. So I usually tell you don't have to do the test. I will ask you what is the importance. But in FNB, they do. So they should be mentally prepared. Most often, they will not be asked to do the professional exam. But I'll ask him why you want to do what do you want to gain from that? They should be able to tell. So, Does that answer the question, Janki? Yes, sir. So, uh, one more thing, sir. How much exposure is expected in a spine examination? How much? Exposure. Means present how much to undress? Yes. <laughs> you see, unfortunately, let's say you are doing a cremastic reflex. I'm talking about a male. A female, if you are doing a parietal examination, so the the deformity, the problem is for a deformity, scoliosis. It is not even exam. Practically, we have a problem today. Things are different, but from the exam point of view, you visualize the area without in any way degrading the patient's individual uh, values. So you will have to ask the friend to be covered. Uh, it's a wish. We also plan the cases, Janke. We never give a uh, young adolescent girl with adolescent scoliosis for the exam. Usually, we choose either a smaller child or a man, where exposing the upper part of the body is not a problem. So, if at all you give, for example, even for FNB, we cover the front so that only the back is exposed. Pre plan that is thing. So, patient, the thing is like that. They have to expose the area which is need to be examined, have a bystander, a female bystander, tell the, get the permission of the invigilator and do that. And 
without decreasing the value of the individual human values. We plan, examiners will plan that and only give, and this applies regularly to our regular examination, even in the ward. There are times when I have regretted not having examined properly because in every backache in a 17-year-old girl, you don't completely examine. And one case died due to some other complication. I don't want to discuss that here. So it is important. It is important that even in regular case, you get a bystander, one from the patient's side, one from your side, two ladies, then do a necessary. You have to examine. You have to examine the perineal lady. And so, uh, one more confusion during spine examination is sir, to examine in supine position uh, by log rolling only or when to allow uh, to sit or stand or to decide about these things. See, acute trauma, nobody is going to keep in the exam. Mm -hmm. uh, Heal the trauma, it doesn't matter. If you are looking at an unstable spine or a tuberculosis where you do not know, you don't test for instability. If whatever is painful or very painful for the patient, we are not supposed to do. This is not only really for spine, for anything. For first and foremost, we are supposed to heal the patient, not trouble the patient. Even if I want to come to a diagnosis, I will not do what is... If straight leg dressing is painful, don't do it. But in the exam, you can't tell everything is painful. I did not examine anything. No case will be kept like that. So if the patient is one who has pain on sitting, that's why I said first you look the gait because then you are going to ask the patient, can you walk? He said, no. Can you sit? No. Then if I cannot do the gait, similarly, then I cannot make the patient sit. So I have to see only in the lying down position, so pain and prone. And uh, yes, if the turning even prone is very painful, you probably don't do it. But usually such cases will not be kept. In a real practical scenario, yes, you have to do it only from one way. I may not be able to turn prone. I put my finger underneath and then palpate if it's acute problem. The bottom line is very important. We should not be, our examination should not make the patient scream by any chance. That's why the investigations are there for knowing the diagnosis. Any, any other questions from, from the delegates? I think you, you're you the ones who should so, be asking the uh, questions. So, uh, Subansu, or everyone is here, sir. If yeah, you have I any know. doubt, you can ask directly. I think you guys right rely now. on Janki to all, ask all your questions for you. That's not... And you should be asking <laughs> your own questions. Yes, sir, one, sir. He's open. No, sir. Nothing to ask, sir. Well, you know everything. Great. Good. No, sir. I don't know everything, sir. Then you should it's have not questions. surprising, Janki. I was in a uh, spine nurse meeting once. Next to me was uh, Rashega. So... The president of the American Spine Society was asking a question, was presenting a, his experience on um, thromboprophylaxis in spine surgery. So I asked a question to the uh, uh, Asher, why, why not, what does he do to tell He said, why are you asking me? You ask him. I told him I'm afraid. He's a typical Indian. So like that, we are all afraid to ask questions. <laughs> this is a common feature to most of us. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, so... If there are no further questions, thank you very much, Raj Gopalan. And it's been a pleasure. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again in the near future. Thank you, John. So, thank uh, you so much. Uh, and it's all, a the best for, all the best for your elections as well. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so okay. much, John. Yeah. Can okay. I leave? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank Bye. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Bye. It was Good great, sir. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Sorry, quite often when Thank you, you call, so I couldn't so. listen to you, but you could have guessed the last six months I've been going to east, west, south, hell to heaven, everywhere. So most of the time I was traveling. That was the reason that I couldn't. Uh... Unfortunately, the God has given me another three months of running. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, that, Thank that's you, great, sir. We'll, we all will support you for IU and businesses for that. Thanks so much. That really means a lot to me. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night, sir. Thank you. Thanks.